Welcome to the VMC Animal Health Education Series. My name is Lauren Kraft, and I'll be your host this evening as we hear from leaders in veterinary medicine as they share their expertise in areas ranging from relevant health information for your beloved pets to ways that we're advancing clinical research that will serve dogs, cats, and people for generations to come. During the presentation, you can use the Q&A function in Zoom to ask questions. We ask that you use the Q&A button instead of the raised hand button as it helps us better track the questions as they come in. We also asked for pre-submitted questions and we'll do our best to cover the themes that came up most frequently during that final portion of the program. Please note that if your question for tonight's presentation relates to your pet's specific medical care, it is best to call a VMC directly or to have your primary care veterinarian contact our team for a consultation so that we can best serve you and your family. And with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker for tonight, Dr. Jamie Senthiraja. Dr. Senthiraja is a veterinarian in our urgent care service where he treats dogs and cats. His interests include urgent care and emergency medicine, internal medicine, and oncology. We're grateful to have Dr. Senthi Raja with us tonight to discuss what clinical signs to look for if you suspect your pet has osteoarthritis. He will also cover how to advocate for treatment options in addition to medications. And with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Senthi Raja. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Thanks for um, attending today's conference or meeting. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, so today we're going to talk about um, osteoarthritis medical management and some options besides medications. We will talk about medication options because they are very important in the overall treatment. So today's outline, we're going to talk about what is osteoarthritis, why is it important, what are the clinical signs, and how is it diagnosed, and what are the treatment options, limiting medication use for various reasons, whether that be for personal beliefs, finances, availability. But again, medications do have a very important um, part of the overall treatment for arthritis. So this presentation is not to say medications are bad. Just want to give you other options to treat arthritis in your pets. So first, we have to understand what osteoarthritis is, and breaking down in parts, osteo means bone, arthro means joint, and itis means inflammation. So it's inflammation of the bones and joints. And osteoarthritis, we often just say arthritis, but osteoarthritis is the wear and tear type of arthritis. It's just like old age arthritis in people um, versus other types of arthritis, which is like rheumatoid arthritis. That's going to be like an autoimmune issue, but that's not the topic of today's presentation. We're going to be talking more of the osteoarthritis aspect. So in the body, there are three types of joints. There's the fibrous joint, and those are joints that you don't want to move around a lot. So those are going to be joints in your skull. You want a lot of stability. You have cartilaginous joints, which are joints that you want a little bit of stability, but you want some movement. So that's going to be a joint in your spine, for instance. And the most important joint that we're going to you know, talk about with the arthritis is the synovial joint. And those are the joints that allow pets and us to run, play, you know, just be more mobile. But with that mobility leads to the increased chance of disease. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, just going back to our anatomy, uh, the joint has three main components. There's the cartilage, which is this inner kind of cushion-like material. It's kind of a shock absorber. There's the joint capsule, which is the outer lining of the joint and the joint fluid, also kind of also called the synovial fluid. And that that's the lubrication that allows joints to glide effortlessly. And then subchondral bone, which is like a cushion-like material for, um, for mobility. And then surrounding muscles, nerves, and connective tissue. So normally with arthritis or in any joint, there's a balance between building of the joint and repair. 
and destruction or damage. And normally it's a fine balance between the two, but with the osteoarthritis, that destruction is a lot more heavy. So the body can't repair itself as fast as it's destroying itself. And that's what leads to um, all the clinical signs and disease later. Um, kind of putting in a picture, the left we have a normal joint. You can see that this cartilage, the white area, is very thick, cushiony. The joint capsule is very thin. Um, and on the osteoarthritis aspect, you can see that cartilage is worn down. And with that worn down cartilage, that's going to be this bone rubbing up against bone. And that obviously can lead to a lot of discomfort and pain. And this joint capsule is pretty thickened as well. So just a lot more inflammation. And that makes mobility a lot more difficult. So the significance, if we think about the joints, you know, we think about liver failure or congestive heart failure or end-stage renal disease. But if we think about the joint as an organ, osteoarthritis is that end-stage organ failure where, you know, a pet is normally going to be able to get up from, you know, their bed and walk around normally. But with osteoarthritis, it can be very limited and it is basically a failure of an organ. A very important concept to know is that osteoarthritis in pets often begins at a young age because it's developmental in origin, and that can be related to genetics, diet, breed. Um, you know, our bigger dogs, our Bernese Mountain Dogs, our German Shepherds, our Goldens, we're a little bit more predisposed to arthritis compared to our um you know, our Maltese, our Chihuahuas. And it is the most common joint disease leading to mobility issues. However, it is very underdiagnosed and overlooked. Again, because in humans, arthritis, you think about, you know, an 80 year old person, you don't think of a, a 15 year old person getting arthritis unless they broke torn ACL or something. Um, in dogs, um, it's estimated that 20% of dogs have arthritis. And the cat studies can vary depending, but it's estimated to be about 20 to 70% of cats can have arthritis. And 50% of dogs are diagnosed um, with arthritis by age 8 to 13. Again, because it's underdiagnosed, we're not thinking of these dogs being arthritic or these cats being arthritic. So we just think they're a little bit slow to get up, but we're not diagnosing them as arthritis. So We'll talk about how to diagnose that earlier. And this osteoarthritis will lead to pain. And if that pain is not addressed or treated appropriately, the patient's quality of life can suffer. And unfortunately, it can lead to an early euthanasia. So we want to avoid that and give them that quality of life so we can get extra years out of them as opposed to potentially euthanizing before their time is up. So the clinical signs of osteoarthritis can vary greatly. Uh, it's going to depend on the patient and how stoic they are and the potential of their lifestyle. You know, it's going to be a little bit more easy to diagnose arthritis in our German Shepherd that's running at the park every day. But a little Chihuahua that's, you know, maybe is in mom's purse all day, not walking around, it's going to be a little bit more challenging to um, diagnose these patients. And cats, obviously, that can be another thing because cats are sleeping most days, so or most of the day, so you're not diagnosing them too often. But some of the things you'll see would be lameness, or also called limping. Um, we might see bunny hopping. They might have difficulty walking up the stairs or going down the stairs, or a little lack of confidence. Um, so if you see those cats like really hesitating to like jump off the cat tree. That could be a big sign that they're arthritic or painful. They might be more stiff, which gets better with time because those joints are becoming more, um, more loose. Muscle atrophy, because the patients aren't using their joints as much, those muscles aren't getting enough blood flow to the area, and they become they can become atrophied, or um, you may see the bones more prominent. 
exercise intolerance. So maybe your pet was able to do 30 minute walks and now it's suddenly 20 minutes and you're just attributing that to it's cold outside or it's hot outside, but it could just be a sign that they're, they're painful. Uh, decreased jumping, like we talked about, lethargy and behavioral changes. So that's going to be really important and things that you as pet owners are going to want to kind of look at. Pets can show pain in different ways. Sometimes they may be more grouchy, just like we are. They may be eating more. They may be eating less. They may be drinking more, maybe drinking less. So if you notice something is not right, that could prompt a visit to your primary veterinarian that warrants further investigation for possible arthritis. So diagnosis of arthritis is gonna be based on history, physical exam, diagnostics, grading and staging, and maybe response to treatment, which we'll talk about. So the history, were they adopted? If that's so, you might not have a history of maybe they um, tore their ACL at one point, or maybe they had previous surgery. Um, do they have previous radiographs? Have they had surgery? So if any of that's known, that could lead us to say like, your pet likely has arthritis, but if they, if we don't have the information, we have to really rely on our physical exam. And again, you'll see lameness or limping. So they might be walked with a little, little bit of a gimp. Then muscle atrophy. So seeing those bones more prominent or not as much muscle covering of their body. And those are the two that you're gonna see mostly um, at home. These other things, joint swelling, pain on joint manipulation, or bone spurs, you know, we don't expect you as clinicians to diagnose any of that, but if you want to feel around your pets and they're not painful, by all means, go for it, but these are going to be the things that the clinician or the veterinarian are going to be able to diagnose. So a couple of videos we have. So you can definitely see this lameness or limping on that left back leg. So the fact that they're walking on three legs means they're painful. And um, once there's some sort of damage to a joint, arthritis has already formed. So we want to intervene sooner. Um, another vote or video. You have a German Shepherd. You can kind of see how we kind of bunny hop and our back legs aren't really like going back and forth. We're just kind of focusing our attention, our weights to our front legs because the dog in this one is trying to put pressure off of its hips. This dog has hip dysplasia as a attempt to alleviate that pain. And dogs are resilient um, to get that done. So, you know, they may not be crying out in pain. They just may be walking differently. Um, and that's something we just have to rely on, like really paying attention to seeing that to know that they're painful. And then we'll not forget about cats. We got a little cat video. Very slow and hesitant to jump off surfaces. So we can see that cats, it's definitely hesitating to want to jump because they're painful. They don't want to take the wrong Slow step. and hesitant going down the stairs. Same with this, maybe you know, maybe it was a leg each time. Maybe a two-year-old cat was able to run up and down the stairs all the time. But as they get older, they're a little bit more hesitant because again, it's a protective mechanism to not injure themselves and alleviate that pain. So these are again things that can be seen at home or in the clinic. And then this is a photo of that muscle atrophy. You can see you can see those different muscle groups. You see one muscle group here, one muscle group here, and that line there, and just you don't have that muscle covering. So if you see this, that should raise a flag that's, you know, there's some arthritis and pain somewhere, and we need to investigate that. And looking at some imaging, on the left, we have a normal joint. Um, I know it's kind of hard for a lot of you to really know, but 
in this, we see this normal joint, um, and there's a lot of black, which just means there's fat in the area. But on this radiograph, we can see a lot more white, and inflammation or fluid is going to show up darker than fat on an x-ray. And the fact that we see this white and even this calcified fluid in the joint means there's arthritis and pain. And this is an x-ray of an elbow. We can see the lines and the margins of all the bones on this one are really crisp. You can see, you know, nice and smooth. And this one, it just, there's white and there's little bone spurs. Um, it's narrowed over here compared to over here. And that joint is really thickened. Again, we don't expect you to be able to diagnose on x-rays, but this is just something that x-rays can give us further evidence of um, how severe that arthritis is. And this is um, arthroscopy or scope of the joint. Um, it's kind of hard to tell, but you know, this is like a normal joint. You can see the lines are really smooth. And here they're just like fragmented and frayed. It's basically like, um, uh, when your sewing thread gets all sprayed at the end. Um, that's my analogy I give. But um, yeah, you can just kind of see that arthritis is, is happening there. So how we can grade arthritis, there's a new staging tool that came out uh, two, three years ago. It's called the Canine Osteoarthritis Staging Tool. There's not one for cats, unfortunately, um, but we'll... We can do a questionnaire that you as pet owners will kind of bring to the clinic. And then the veterinarian does their exam. And then they evaluate that with x-rays to get a zero to four severity scale. And four is obviously severe, zero is non-existent. Um, so this is kind of putting it into schematic. And putting that grade or that number can really help because if you just say your pet's arthritic, it may not really show us or tell us a lot, but if we can put a stage or a number, that could be something that's really helpful in saying we need to intervene sooner to prevent this, a three getting to a four, or hopefully getting that four down to like a two or even a three. Um, so that number can really help us. But it's not an absolutely necessary step, but it can be helpful. And then response to treatment. So these are tough because, you know, sometimes we can't always get x-rays for various reasons or scoping. And we may just do some medications, but there is a placebo effect where if you just give medications, there was a study in one of our veterinary journals that if you give a medication to a, an arthritic dog, um, the placebo effect was noted in 50 to 60% of pet owners where they got the placebo and they thought their pet was doing better, but based on uh, different testing, we know it actually didn't do much. Um, so it's not ideal to just give medications without a known diagnosis. That's why we really want to do those x-rays or advanced imaging if possible and rely on our physical exam. So the treatment options, there's surgery or medical management. Surgery is not the scope of today's discussion, but if surgery is recommended by your veterinarian, often it's probably the best thing to do. But we'll focus on medical management, and this can be adjunct in addition to surgery or a sole therapy if surgery is not feasible for whatever reason. Um, with the medical management, you want a multimodal strategy, so you want different mechanisms. Um, because they all work different ways. So if you want to treat arthritis, you need to do it multimodal. And at-home treatment is important, easy, and inexpensive, or cheap, or free. So everyone loves a mnemonic, so I came up with a mnemonic called the Few Meds Approach. Uh, we'll go through each one. Uh, the F is for focused physical therapy, and that's going to be range of motion, stretching, massage, thermotherapy, and bedding. Range of motion is going to be influenced by many factors such as breed, their conformation, their weight. 
And when we say pram, that's called passive range of motion. So that's basically when you're taking the joint um, and you're, I use my uh, finger for example, you're flexing and extending to the point where it's not painful. So you're just trying to get that normal motion of what the joint is supposed to do. Because when pets are arthritic, they don't want to move and those joints become really stiff and a lot of scar tissue forms. So that range of motion gets that body kind of realizing this is what I'm supposed to do and it prevents that scar tissue from forming. And that's going to make our joint healthy and it's going to promote cartilage health. But again, you want to make sure patient comfort is um, adhered to. So you don't want to extend and flex to the point where your pet is screaming out in pain because otherwise they're going to resist it and it's going to do more harm than good. You're just going to do um, specific treatments. And as far as specifics, these are all things that you and your primary vet will be able to do a tailored treatment. These are just kind of general guidelines. Every pet is unique, so talk to your primary veterinarian about what exactly needs to be done. Um, stretching, that's elongating those muscle groups, um, and that's going to potentially reduce the risk of further trauma. An analogy is, you know, we see athletes all the time on TV or in person. They're stretching before their big game. Same thing for a pet. Their 30-minute walk when they're arthritic is their big game. So if we can do some stretching to loosen up those joints, it may make um, their activity a little less painful. And heating of the joint before stretching can be helpful because it loosens up those joints. Massaging, you know, humans, we think of it as um, an indulgence, but it does have some medical um, benefits. And research, it's been shown to increase um, blood flow and lymphatic return, which promotes healing. Uh, it gets rid of all the bad molecules and brings in the good molecules that are good for joint health. And it's also been shown to reduce stress and increase serotonin, which is the, the feel-good molecule. Thermotherapy, that's going to be, again, heating the joints before exercise and then icing after, you know, maybe a 30-minute walk, if they're really stiff, you might put a little ice pack on their on their elbow or their knee. Same analogy, after games, athletes will ice their, you know, their shooting shoulder. Betting, there's still a lot of human research um, ongoing, and there hasn't been a lot of uh, veterinary research so far. But in general, a medium-firm betting or a memory foam bed is recommended and you want it to be non slip so you don't want that bed to like slip out from underneath them when they crawl into it. Um, so obviously, you know, we like a good night's sleep. Our dogs and our cats also like to sleep really comfortably. Uh, we have exercise. We want to reduce that excessive mechanical trauma. So exercise is important because we want to control this. This is not these arthritic patients, we don't want to go to the park and just like let them loose for three hours. We want this to be controlled. And there's terrain versus aquatic exercise. So terrain exercise, you're going to want consistent and frequent low impact controlled setting exercise. So those are going to be leash walks for what I tell pet owners, if you can, depending on your lifestyle, Go on a 10 minute walk every couple of hours. There's been studies that show that exercise over 60 minutes per day is helpful um, to get these dogs uh, less painful and more active. And if you're infrequent on this exercise, you're not training them that they need to go out. If you make this a consistent habit, they get that mental stimulation, plus they like to go out for dogs, maybe cats. Um, and we're just gonna train that body like this is what I'm supposed to do, prevent that scar tissue, make those joints more lax and loose. Then there's aquatic exercise. There's underwater treadmill versus swimming. In general, underwater treadmill is gonna be better 
because it's a more controlled setting. You can adjust the temperature of the water, the incline, the speed. And why this works is the water, the buoyancy of water, limits the um, strain on the joints. So you're putting more of that muscle or that um, strain on the muscle as opposed to the joints, and it builds that muscle strength up. So underwater treadmill is great, but swimming is an option if um, underwater treadmill is not available. Uh, just make sure the water, obviously, it's not Minnesota winter when you're doing this. Um, and that's going to increase the range of motion and circulation. And a lot of dogs love this mental stimulation. You get the occasional cat that will tolerate this, but um, it's not so much a cat activity. Um, and then weight management. Obesity prevalence is increasing. Uh, there's studies that uh, 40 to 50% of dogs are overweight um, and cats it's even higher because of their, their lifestyle. And fat is just not a storage tissue. There's been human studies that show that obesity is a causative factor in the development of hand arthritis. And if you think about that, the hand is not a weight-bearing part of your body. So the fact that patients are more obese and getting arthritis in their hands gives a lot of supporting evidence that fats can increase your risk of arthritis. And there's a lifespan study that came out a couple decades ago. This can really be helpful. That dogs that were fed meals as opposed to just having food out, by eight years of age, only 10% of them developed arthritis. And the dogs that just had food available and were overweight, 77% of those dogs were arthritic at eight years of age. And that same study, the dogs that were fed a limited food and were more lean lived about two years longer than their obese counterparts. So we want these pets to live longer, have more life, more love. Um, cats, there's no study on that yet, but just using kind of common thinking, same principle. And this is a chart that you may have seen in your local vets. It's a body condition score where it's a one to nine scale, depending on, you know, how obese they are. One is skin and bones and nine is like a sausage. We want them in the four to five range. So we want to see that tuck when we look at from over uh, overhead. And it's important once that weight loss is um, normalized, we want to continue that management. So it's not a free pass that you lost 20 pounds. Here's a free pass to gain five pounds. Medications, we'll briefly talk about this. Um, there's non steroidal anti-inflammatories, great drugs. Uh, they reduce inflammation and pain. It's important that we want veterinary prescription anti-inflammatories because dogs and cats metabolize um, and non steroidal anti-inflammatories very differently than people. And they don't work as well in dogs as they do in people. The veterinary prescriptions are the most beneficial. Um, so don't use over-the-counter anti-inflammatories without veterinary advice. Patient health is going to be important. If you're going to switch NSAIDs or non steroidal you need to wait a few days before just starting a new one because not every anti-inflammatory is going to work for every pet. You know, it's like some people like Coke, some people like Pepsi. Same with dogs and cats. One might work better than the other. And because it's metabolized by the kidneys and it affects the liver, these pets are going to want um, need blood work rechecks. So again, anti-inflammatory is very useful, but if we can't do it for various reasons, um, we have other options. There's something called Adequan, which is a subcutaneous injection that you give, or the veterinarian can give, depends on your comfort level. They don't really know the exact me mechanism, but it has been shown to reduce cartilage destruction and enhance cartilage building. 
So again, FDA approved, so it's been studied that works really well. I've had a lot of success with it, and it's a very safe um, treatment option. This is a new kit on the block called Cinevetin, which is a yearly joint injection. So you go straight into the joint and it reduces inflammation. Um, honestly, very safe um, based on the study so far, just um, not as readily available. Silencio, also a newer product, which is a monthly injection that you give or the veterinarian gives and reduces inflammation and pain. Um, very, very safe. Uh, just availability might be a little limited. Amantadine, that's another pain medication that can be used. Gabapentin, also another pain medication that can be used. And opioids. Um, opioids are pain reducers. Some of you may have been prescribed tramadol in the past. And tramadol works in people, but in dogs, it's metabolized very differently. So their bioavailability or how much of it gets into the bloodstream is very, very limited. So a lot of it is the placebo effect where you give a medication and you think they're doing better, but realistically or medically, it shouldn't really work. So we try not to do tramadol because the studies are very lacking. In cats, they do metabolize tramadol pretty well compared to people, um, but it's a very bitter tablet. So getting a cat to take a tablet is hard and a bitter tablet, good luck, but it may work. Uh, then there's electrical equipment. Um, I'll talk about each one. There's targeted pulsed electromagnetic field. That's something called the ACC loop. Um, it is an FDA approved device in humans. And it's this little device that works really great for cats. You can also use it for dogs. And it's a little device that you hold over their affected joints. And it improves healing and oxygenation, improves blood flow to the area, and it increases cartilage growth. So again, you're tipping the scale to more of that building. So most Patients tolerate this really well, had great success with it in my clinical experience, and I would strongly recommend this. Um, and this is something that, again, you as pet owners can do at home. You don't have to come to a clinic to do this. There's photobiomodulation, which is laser therapy. Uh, that's something that the pet would have to come to the clinic. Cats do really well with this, dogs do really well. It improves healing and it can recover those atrophied muscles. And it's been shown to reduce cartilage destruction. There's neuromuscular electrical, electrical stimulation, which is like a TENS unit. Um, they've been shown to improve muscle strength and tone, improve healing and reduce inflammation. And they also release endogenous opioids or pain reduction. And in human medicine, it's been shown to reduce muscle atrophy after injuries. And in veterinary medicine, it's been shown to reduce uh, cartilage destruction. This is a device that um, can be done at home, depending on your comfort level. Your veterinarian can give you specific brands and advice on this. There's electro, electro acupuncture, and that's basically putting little needles into the body, putting electric charge to it. It's been shown to improve local blood supply, and it's been shown to also release endogenous opioids to reduce that pain and endorphins, so the feel-good molecules. Training is necessary for the use of acupuncture, so this isn't going to be that your average veterinarian is able to do, does require quite a bit of training, but it is a very good option. And then there's shockwave, and that's using sound wave to reduce lameness or limping. What that does is it increases blood flow to the area. It increases tissue regeneration. So again, building up that cartilage and reduces pain. So it helps with analgesia. 
um, it's been shown to increase weight bearing post TPLO, which is then knee surgery procedure. So very, very um, helpful. Is a little bit more limited on availability, but um, it is becoming a little bit more prevalent. Diets, I really like diet because you just put food out and they do, there's only a dog version, there's no, not a cat version, but you just put the food out and most dogs take it really well. Those diets contain molecules that are important, important for joint health. So again, it helps that, uh, that building back up the cartilage. The prescription brands are Purina JM, Hills JD, and Royal Canin Mobility Support. Um, these are the prescription ones. They have a little bit more research behind it. So I would recommend one of these over an over-the-counter that doesn't have a lot of claim to it. It is important to note that weight monitoring is an important aspect with the diet. Because these diets have more fish oils, which are fat, they're more caloric dense than the average food. So pets can get a little bit more obese or pack on the pounds with these diets. So monitoring their weight is really important. And then there's supplements. Supplements are an increasing prevalence in industry. In 2015, it was like a $500 million industry, and that was like a 4% increase over the prior year. As you can imagine, it's probably, I would guess, like in the billion dollar range by now. Um, so it's very important because studies have shown that up to 33% of pet owners have used a supplement for their pets in the past year. So we need to talk about this, obviously. But with that, there are issues with the regulations and laws. Because supplements are not FDA approved, they're not regulated by the government, all supplements have to say is they're not intended to cure or treat any disease. And that's for a human supplement. Veterinary supplements don't have to say anything. So any company can make a supplement and say it's doing this when in reality, we don't even know if that's the case. So you're really going to want doctor recommendations because we have those the knowledge of like which ones have the best studies, which ones are safe, which ones are safe for your pet that is taking this medication, this supplement. Um, so if you're thinking about supplements, please involve your veterinarian and don't feel ashamed of telling them you give a supplement because we want to know that so we can make the best treatment um, options for you. Those supplements with the best research or the most common at the moment are omega-3 fatty acids, glucosamine and chondroitin, and green-lipped muscle. There are many others. Further research is ongoing, but we'll just focus on these three today. So omega-3 fatty acids, you're going to want the DHA and the EPA, and those are the specific molecules that if you look at the back of the bottle, it will say how many milligrams are in each capsule or in the scoop. You don't want the ALA fatty acid because that's the fatty acids that's in flaxseed, and dogs and cats don't metabolize flaxseed to get to, um, to be able to be used. So the fish oils are the most important. And those fish oils reduce infl inflammatory mediators in the body. And there's capsules versus liquid, depends on the patient and which one they tolerate. Um, cats can do really well with this, with the capsules uh, or the liquid. Dogs do really well in general. The brand I like the most and find the most success with is called Waylactin. But there are others, so talk with your primary veterinarian about which recognition is best for your pets. It is important to know that these do take about two weeks to work. So if your dog or cat has some acute injury, this isn't going to be something that immediately is going to work. It takes time. Glucosamine chondroitin, that's going to be something in 
cosequin or dasequin, something we use and I used when I was a kid or my parents used as a kid and my dog. Those molecules are the building blocks of cartilage. Veterinary studies are lacking on how effective these supplements are. However, it is a very generally safe medication or supplements. Um, so it may potentially cause diarrhea, but other than that, they're safe, but it may not be doing as much as we think it's doing. And then there's green lipped muscle, and those contain molecules that are important for joint health. Quality control is very important because they have to be processed at a low temperature. Um, and Antonol, this is the green lipped muscle product that I've had the most success with, but there are other ones out there. Again, talk to your primary veterinarian about which one they recommend. So I know we went pretty fast on that, but wanted to get through everything. Osteoarthritis is prevalent. However, again, underdiagnosed, it is affecting our young pets more than we think. So we want to intervene sooner to give them the best quality of life. That pain is, is a significant source of patient discomfort, leading to behavioral changes or mobility issues. And a multimodal approach is recommended and necessary. Again, you want to treat arthritis different ways to get the best outcome. It will vary based on patient health and other, other factors, like how severe the arthritis is. And it is a long-term treatment. So it's not going to be something we do for a month and call it, call it good. We diagnose them at five years of age. We're going to be doing it, you know, hopefully for 10, 15 years or so. And you want to discuss these treatment options with your primary care veterinarian. Your primary care, primary care veterinarian knows about all these options. We just need to see which one is more desired by you and which one's available so we can give you the best treatments. And referral for further treatment may be recommended if a certain treatment option isn't available with your primary veterinarian. So with that, I thank you for your time uh, coming out um, on a Wednesday night right before dinner. So open up the floor to any questions and Lauren and Scott and Megan will kind of help you with that. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, it was really helpful presentation. I know I learned a lot about some of the, the nuances. So we had a lot of great questions come in in advance and tonight, so we'll just jump right in. Um, there was a question about younger pets. And so someone asked, is it possible for younger pets, such as a three-year-old dog or cat, to have osteoarthritis? Yeah, really good question. Again, um, we don't think of it uh, just because we think of arthritis. We think of people, a seven-year-old person getting arthritis, but dogs are running around. They're more prone to it via genetics and breed and they can tear their ACL potentially at any moment. So yeah, it definitely affects our younger population and we definitely want to intervene sooner in these pets. Okay. Okay. Maybe this is, um, this is another question kind of on the prevention side of things. So um, could surgery prevent osteoarthritis? That is, if my pet has surgery, do I have to worry about my pet getting arthritis or needing different treatments down the line after the fact? Yeah, good question as well. So once we have like an ACL tear, for instance, normally that ligament is keeping the tibia and the femur together. When that ACL is torn, the bones are rubbing up against one another. So surgery is going to help stabilize that knee, but once that ligament is torn, that arthritis cascade has already started. So the sooner we can intervene with surgery, the better, because then we hopefully need to only start a lot of these treatments like five years from now, as opposed to like two years from now. So yeah, surgery is very important if possible. Okay. Um, and then you talked about medication and supplements. So this question is about the long-term use of Rimadol in older and achy dogs. 
do you see um, benefits? What are the risks? Are there alternatives? And is there a preferred long-term pain medication option? Yeah, as far as medications, um, uh, veterinary prescription non anti-inflammatories have a lot of research that work really well. Um, there's a lot of clinician preference on which one they like the most, but because they're processed by the organs, if there's liver disease or kidney disease, these medications may not be um, a great option. We may need them sparingly to get them over a hump. Um, say you took them to the park and they're really sore, you may need to do that. But the goal of this kind of presentation is to give you other options besides medications, um, because ideally we want us as people to, the less medications we can take, the better, but medications do have their place in providing comfort. Sure. Um, I know you talked a little bit about exercises and there was a question of, can you recommend different types of exercises that people can do with cats? Yeah, so that range of motion exercise is really good. Again, depends on how much they tolerate. Um, stretching, again, if they tolerate. And, you know, cats like laser pointers, feathers. So if we can get them like walking around on the floor, that's really helpful rather than just like sleeping and, you know, making those joints more stiff. And if you have a kitten, you know, get him exposed to the outdoors. I, I have a friend that takes his cat hiking and he's on a leash. So it's not for everyone, not for every cat, but, you know, if you have a younger cat that's open to it, get them out there. They can exercise. Fun. Um... All right, you touched on on this a little, talking about some of the newer medication options. Maybe you can um, speak to the difference and if it's, you know, if you think it's better or worse, maybe than some of the older ones. And people are asking about um, Silencia, Sinopin, I might be mispronouncing that. Um, but just what are some more detailed thoughts on the newer options that are out? Yeah, so Silencia is like a medication called Cytopoint, uh, which is an allergy medication, where Silencia just targets the protein that's involved with inflammation and pain signaling. So it doesn't do anything else to liver the kidneys. So because it's really targeted, it's working really great, uh, but it is an injection that you, the veterinarian or the client has to give, um, but I haven't personally used it, but I've had colleagues that their pet owners have said it's worked really well. Um, so more research coming on that, I'm sure. And Sinovetin is a joint injection that the veterinarian's going to have to give. Uh, that's an injection you give that's going to last for a year, and it targets the inflammatory mediators in the joint. So it prevents those from like running rampant. Um, that's when anytime you put something into a joint that needs to be super, super sterile to not introduce an infection. So that's going to have to be most likely with a primary vet under like heavy sedation so the pet doesn't move. Um, but because it's targeted, very safe, minimal side effects from what I've read so far. Okay, great. Um, I know this is always hard as a pet owner. So how can you tell stiffness um, from actual pain, those sort of smaller nuances? Yeah. So honestly, stiffness is a sign of pain. Anytime we're kind of limping around and just like, oh, it's achy, you know, we're painful, but dogs are resilient or cats are resilient too. If you say, if you have an arthritic dog and you say, let's go to the park or let's go to walk, their ears go up. They don't care because in their mind, today is the last day they're ever going to live. So they don't know that they're sick, for instance. So if you see stiffness, that is a sign that they're painful. They just may not be showing the other symptoms that we would expect. Okay. Um, you talked about this a little in terms of um, warming up joints. So how do you recommend... Um, warming up before joint stretching is a heating pad okay to use? I think you you mentioned that, but if someone is using it, how do you recommend they use it? Are there different settings you recommend or what are the uh, details with that? Yeah, so um, I'll 
like microwave like a rice bag and put it in the or put it in the microwave and then just test it on your skin and if it's too hot for you then um you know don't use it on your pet if it's nice and soothing do that uh, the nice thing about pets is their fur kind of transmits that heat so you can do what i recommend is do a couple minutes on the joint and then take it off and then take it off for like a minute or two and then go back for a couple minutes and do like two or three repetitions uh, because that residual heat's going to get deeper down and help so okay. generally like two four minutes or so um you know before exercise or stretching is my recommendation okay great um, this is maybe getting back to a bit of the prevention, but if I get a new puppy, are there play activities to avoid right from the start? Yeah. So when we're puppies, they're energetic. So I kind of like to let them set their own pace to get that mental kind of stimulation. But I wouldn't go from like, you got a dog from the shelter to let's go on a five mile hike right away. Do a gradual thing. And if they're tiring out, then, you know, maybe tone them down a little bit. Also be prepared if you, like, go on a long walk and they're, like, out of it. They're going to be, need to be carried home or call an Uber or a friend so they're not putting more strain. But, you know, generally, I wouldn't have, like, a puppy, you know, jumping off, you know, the bed, for instance. But they go on a walk, a little, little tiny hike, but don't overdo it is generally okay. what I recommend. Okay. Yeah. And that's kind of similar to the next question. Are there any steps we should be taking now to minimize risk of problems later in our current dog's life? So maybe that's the same type of question, just at a different life stage for the animal. Yeah. So um, probably the biggest thing for pet owners is going to be keeping them lean. And if you can start that at a younger age, like don't just have food out because then they're just going to keep gorging. And, you know, we feel bad. We're like, oh, your bowl's empty. Here's some more food. Um, if we can really meal feed them and kind of know how many calories we should be feeding them in a day, that's going to be the most crucial thing. And it's going to give us, again, another two years of life based on that study. So I would talk with your primary veterinarian to really ask them, how many calories should my pet eat? Are they overweight? And if they're overweight, do not feel ashamed. It happens. Um, my dog that lives with my parents, she's overweight. Um, it happens to the best of us, but knowing that they are overweight can at least get us feeling better sooner. Sure. Um, so this question's for senior dogs who the um, family already knows they have osteoarthritis. So are there exercises for senior dogs to help with osteoarthritis discomfort or things like hip dysplasia? And are there any moves for those dogs that we shouldn't do? Yeah, so the range of motion is one of my favorites. And massage. Just you can do this when you're sitting on the couch with your pets, you know, watching TV, just move their joints around, use your palm of your hand and massage, get some blood flow to the area. Really super easy, free, and it's going to make a lot of difference later on. So um, those are the big ones. Okay, great. Um, you talked about supplements. Um, so this is more about how they they work do supplements like collagen and glucosamine keep dogs more limber as they age yeah so in vitro like in like laboratory testing they do but like we kind of discussed they don't there's not a lot of veterinary research on the collagen supplements um but it's one of those things where it may be working anecdotally when i was again a kid my parents used those collagen supplements and i think my dog did better but i didn't really have any like research to back up but sure. by all means um it's perfectly generally okay to use and is there a certain um age that people should start considering giving supplements to their their pets especially if they're really active um i i think fish oils are good kind of when they're getting to like that three four range that's probably going to be the supplement that I'd recommend the most. 
But again, use that discussion with your primary vet because if there's GI issues that prohibit its use, maybe it's not the best thing. But three is when I kind of start talking like, again, they could start developing arthritis. Let's try to give some inflammation reduction now. Okay. Um, this is about a, a pet who has a sensitive stomach. So there's probably a few people who have experienced that with their animals. So um, I have a senior dog that has a very sensitive stomach and does not tolerate oral pain medications well. What um, alternative therapies could you suggest for a pet with that um, challenge? Yeah. So if they do need medication, like if that's recommended by your veterinarian, just making sure those anti-inflammatories are given with a full meal, that's going to greatly reduce the risk of GI upset. Um, but as far as other medications, um, the Cinovedin, the Silencia for cats, the things that have very, very minimal side effects, especially on your GI, those are going to be your medications to use. But any of these other options are are great. The range of motion, the a CC loop, that electromagnetic um, device, um, weight management. So yeah, a lot of other things we can do besides the diet for those or besides the medications. And someone else asked, um, just because you mentioned um, Silencia with cats, is Silencia safe for cats with um, CKD stage three? Um, yes, they showed that stage two and three it was fine with, it do, doesn't look like they did any studies with the stage four kitties, but okay. um, the stage two and three, they were fine. Okay. We've got a lot of good cat questions today. Yeah. So the next couple are about, um, I think you talked about this a little different exercises with cats, um, but maybe if you can expand on that in symptom recognition, I know you showed a couple of good yeah. videos for that too. Yeah. So um with the um, cats, the big ones that we're going to notice, again, is if you have like a cat tree or a bed or stairs, are they hesitating or looking at you before they're jumping? That's a, that's a red flag that they're painful. Or do they, you know, not land appropriately? So normally you'd expect cats on all four legs, do they kind of flop over or fall over? That's a sign they're painful. That muscle atrophy, that's a big one. Um, do we see their their spine or their their hip bones a little bit more apparent? And then are they just a little bit more kind of quiet than usual? So again, cats generally are sleeping like 18, 20 hours a day. Are they now sleeping 22 hours? And these are very subtle things that us as clinicians, we are not seeing that because when cats come to the clinic, you know, they may hate us and they're still like trying to kill us. Um, or they're like super friendly and they're not showing us that pain. But when they're at home in their environment, that's going to be when you're going to notice that the most. And one thing that I recommend is if anything ever looks abnormal, dogs or cats, video record it with your phone and show that to your vets because that one thing that you saw may not be repeatable for you know another two weeks it's like when you take your car to the shop they may not see it so video recording can be very helpful and that can point us like oh yeah that's really abnormal we should take an x-ray or you know do some at-home exercises yeah that's a good reminder um okay we have time for one more question so uh what about meloxicam for medicine i haven't heard that one come up yet oh yeah meloxicam is a good anti-inflammatory um it's kind of a, again, a clinician preference. I don't use it a lot, but it's a really good one. Um, so as long as your veterinarian says it's safe for your pets, there's a lot of good, good studies with meloxicam. So um, okay. very helpful. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Cynthia Rajan, for an excellent presentation. And Thanks to our many participants who shared thoughtful questions in advance and during the presentation. Um, as always, the VMC is here for you 24-7 to help care for your pet. Please do not hesitate to reach out to us. And if you enjoyed learning about our team's work tonight, we encourage you to visit our website, reach out to us directly uh, 
to learn more about our mission to improve the health and well-being of animals and people. And we hope that you will uh, consider supporting the Lewis Small Animal Hospital, including our urgent care team. So next month, we will welcome Dr. Jen Granick from our Small Animal Internal Medicine Service. Dr. Granick will present snotty noses and litter box problems. When are antibiotics likely to help and when might they harm? A talk on the urinary and respiratory ailments that are common in cats. And thank you so much for joining us tonight. Yeah, thanks everyone. Have a good uh, good dinner.